Okay, so um, welcome everyone to this uh, DOOB lecture uh, at the World Congress of the Banu Society. And um, um, uh, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Nicolas, Nicolas Curien from uh, University Paris-Saclay, uh, which um, I know, I did know him for, I have been, I have known him for quite a while. Uh, he was part of uh, this uh, intimidating class of uh, students at Ecole Normale that was uh, following uh, one of my uh, graduate courses. I remember having, uh, you know, in the front row, there were Johan and uh, Hugo and Nicola. And uh, you always felt uh, this is, you know, the type of class where you feel that the, at the end, it's not the, the lecturer who uh, has to you know, grade the students, but the students are grading the lecturer, seeing you know, how many mistakes they did. And anyway, so then he became one of these uh, great uh, young probabilists who uh, defended their thesis in 2011. There are quite a number of them around. Uh, and um, so he did his PhD with Jean-Francois Le Gall. So we have quite a lot of similarities in our CVs with Nicolas. Uh, then uh, he had a, a position at CNRS, uh, still in Paris, and then he moved on to Orsay, where he's a professor since 2014. Um, I, I like to say that you know when we are in um, uh, hiring committees for our own university, you know the goal is to find people that are better, faster, and will do your job better, much better than you do yourself, and. Uh, I think Orsay, you know, uh, uh, he he was hired as a probabilist in Orsay just uh, immediately after I left, and I'm sure the students are very happy about this uh, now, and the colleagues as well. Um, so he received uh, quite a number of prizes already for his uh, uh, works, uh, including the Jacques Herbrand Prize uh, two years ago, which is a prize of the French uh, Academy or the Roller Davidson Prize uh, in 2015. I think by now, uh, three of that uh, class uh, of students uh, that I mentioned did receive this Roller Davidson Prize. Um, so he's a very inspiring lecturer, a uh, very dynamic lecturer, at least in, in the real world. Um, uh, it's always uh, fun to uh, look at his lectures, to read his lecture notes. I recommend to everyone to go to his webpage to have a look at his, the lecture notes he's written. And he's a wonderful mentor of uh, PhD for PhD students as well already. He has quite a number behind, uh, behind. So he has written, I think already more than about 50 papers. Uh, and of course, there are a number of themes there, but maybe the overarching theme is understanding the large scale, you know, uh, behavior of discrete random structures related maybe to trees or random planar structures and understanding their asymptotics. So um, he's receiving, of course, today, this wonderful certificates from the hands of uh, Claudia and Susan uh, that he has uh, giving the, this is the Doob lecture. Uh, and of course, there would be a lot to say between the relation between the wonderful Joe Doob and Nicolas Curien, uh, but I'll just not eat up too much of my time. And uh, we're looking forward to your lecture, uh, Nicolas, on parking on KD trees and frozen Erdős rainy. Thank you very much, Vendelin, for this wonderful introduction. Very kind. Not sure I recognize myself, but thanks anyway. It's an honor uh, for me to be here and to receive this, uh, this uh, certificate for the double lecture. And um, uh, okay, we are not in the real world, but uh, I'll, I'll try my best to uh, entertain you. And uh, feel free, no pressure. Uh, if you have questions, please interrupt. Because, uh, uh, okay, the, I hope everybody can see my, uh, my screen, my slides. So the topic that I want to, to, to talk to you uh, about today, is a topic that uh, is actually quite fun. I, I think it's quite fun. So it's a, a paper that we put on archive with uh, Alice Conta uh, last uh, last week about parking on random trees and uh, frozen erdos. So it's a 
very basic model you will see, but which uh, has a deep ramification with many, uh, many uh, probabilistic objects that were around uh, since, uh, you know, 20 years. This is just a teaser for the talk. So we will be trying uh, to park cars on trees, but on the way we will see uh, several characters that uh, some of you may have encountered in probability theory, such that uh, such as the uh, continuum random tree, Aldous continuum random tree, or uh, more uh, prosaically the Erdos-Renyi random graph that you may all know. But uh, you know we will also see stable processes, gross fragmentation trees. I will introduce all that. And, and probably uh, a link which I'm not very confident about with uh, planar maps. So that was for the teaser. I hope you are all motivated. And again, if something is not clear, please interrupt. So let me start uh, right away with the model. So the model is very simple. You have a parking lot, which is a tree, a directed tree that you see here. So you have a tree and uh, I hope you all see my pointer. So the vertex on the bottom of the tree here is the root of the tree, and we will orient all the edges of the tree towards this bottom vertex that we will think of as the exit of the parking lot. So the parking lot has a tree structure, okay? And then we will let car arrive on the vertices of this tree, so on the spot of the parking lot. I will tell you the rule after that. And then, so cars are number from one up to uh, n, and we will park the cars as they arrive using the, you know, the obvious rule. So the obvious rule is car number one arrives on the spot. The spot is initially free, so it parks there. Okay, so you see this blue car here parked. Then car number two arrives on this spot and parks on the spot because it was available. Then car number three arrives on this spot and actually, every vertex or any spot, any parking place can accommodate at most one car. So the car number three will have to find another spot. And for that, the car just follows the arrows, the oriented arrows, until it finds a spot that is free. OK? And I will put a one on this arrow just to indicate that this arrow has seen one car going through it. So it's a flux of car. OK? Then car number four arrives here on this spot. The, the place is already taken, so it follows the arrow and will park here. Okay, the same with car number five. Very easy, it's, uh, it's a free spot. Car number six here, free spot. Car number seven parks here. Then car number eight. So car number eight arrives on this spot. It's taken, so follows this arrow, it's taken. And there is no more a free spot on the parking lot, so this car, we just exit the parking lot without having managed to find the spot, okay? So it's an outgoing flux of car. This car, number eight, will not park, okay? And it will happen the same thing with this car, number nine, because it arrives on five, here, taken, taken, three, four, and then exit, okay? Is the model clear for everybody? Do not hesitate to interrupt. Okay, so that's parking on a tree. That's the deterministic rule to park cars labeled by one up to n m on, uh, on an oriented uh, acyclic graph. Obviously, uh, there is a ton of literature on the very simple model where the parking lot is a line. It's a special case of a tree. And this has been studied in depth in the literature since the 60s, uh, work of Kuhnem and Weiss, Knut, Chassin, Louchard, Bertouin, Marquard, Mirmont. There are really uh, beautiful papers there. And the message there is that there is a phase transition, but when, uh, it might be surprising at first sight, when the density of car is almost one. So if you think a minute, it's uh, really uh, a bit counterintuitive. You imagine that you have a parking lot, which is a line of length n, and you let cars arrive uh, IID uniformly on the vertices of this line. You know, the first one, the second one. And you ask, when will the parking lot will be saturated? I mean, when uh, is the probability that a new car arriving on the parking lot will not find a parking space? Well, actually, there, in this model, uh, the phase transition happens when the density of car is one. If you launch 0 0.99 times n cars on this line of length n, they will all manage 
all, almost all managed to work. Okay, and very close to this density of one, there is a phase transition appearing. And uh, there, the code words are coding by random walk, the boy and CRT, additive coalescence, and so on. This is a very uh, uh, well known story with beautiful, beautiful objects. But in our case, we will not focus on the line, we will take uh, another model. So now our parking lot will be a uniform Cayley tree of size n. So, what is this object? It's just the most basic uh, random tree that you may think of, you have n labeled vertices, you see, from one up to n. There is no orientation. It's, it's, it's drawn on the plane, but there is no orientation there. Just the vertices are labeled. And you take a tree connecting those uh, n vertices uniformly at random. So it's very well known that there are n to the n minus 2 choices. It's Cayley's formula. And so you pick one of these three uniformly at random. And for our purposes, then we will distinguish one vertex here, the number 6. So it's just a uniform vertex between 1 and n, which is the bottom of the tree, which enables us to orient all the edges and to define our parking lot. OK? So that's the model for our random parking lot. Then conditionally on this, then we will just let cars arrive one by one uniformly and independently on the vertices of the tree. And we will park them according to the rule I just described. OK? And the goal of uh, this talk is to tell you that there is a phase transition for this model, and we will try to understand uh, precisely what happens uh, at the phase transition and to get scaling limits uh, uh, when n and m are large. OK, so the fact that there is a phase transition was established uh, a couple of years ago by uh, Lackner and Panolzer, and they showed that, so keep this in mind, n is always the size of the system. So n here is the size of the tree. And m will be an evolving parameter, will be the number of cars. So we will really see this dynamically. We will have a parking lot of size n, and m will increase from 1 to blah, 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 blah up to n. And we will see dynamically what, what happens. But suppose first that we launch a proportion of car, meaning that m over n tends to alpha. Alpha is a number between 0 and 1. So that's the proportion, the, the density of car that you launch in your parking lot. And we will just count D and M. D is for discarded. It's the number of cars that did not manage to park. OK? Then Lackner and Panelzer, using combinatorial enumeration, prove that there is a phase transition, meaning that if alpha is less than 0.5, then roughly speaking, all cars manage to park, all but big O of 1. And if alpha is super critical, uh, bigger than 0 0.5, then there is a positive fraction of cars. So there is a C here, which is strictly positive. So that's the number of cars that did not manage to park. That means that the positive proportion of them did not manage to park. OK? If you have not understood that, wait. Uh, I have uh, videos, movies to illustrate that. But this was uh, the pioneer work of Lackner and Panazza. And since then, uh, there is an uh, increasing body of literature that has been uh, uh, developed around that theme. Let me mention a couple of names there. And uh, the, the model and the fact that there is a phase transition is actually much more general than uh, uh, this case of uh, Kelly trees with IID cards. You can change the model, and there, is, there, there will be a phase transition. Exactly as in percolation, you can change the combinatorial details of the model, and there will still be a phase transition. OK? But, but let me, uh, you know, movies are better than uh, long uh, sentences. So let me show you a movie illustrating this phase transition. So here you have a Kelly tree that has been drawn on the plane. So this is a Kelly tree with 2,000 vertices. So the vertices, you don't see them, but you imagine that they are at the end of, this, uh, of these edges there. And uh, I will let car arrive one by one. This parameter m here will uh, increase. And here m is equal to 2. So you see those two black dots. These are two cars that have already parked. OK, so let's launch the video. You see cars arriving on the, on the tree, and they park. And the color that you see, so this, for example, this yellow color here, means that to find a parking spot, a car had to go through some edge 
and the color and the width of the edge is representative of the flux of card that went through that particular edge. So remember that I said that uh, the phase transition happens at alpha is equal to 0.5. So when around 1,000 cars have parked. So we are still in the subcritical phase. And you see that there are no major conflicts that most of the cars that arrived so far have managed to park. So let me pause. You see the cluster of cars. So you see those clusters. Those are these orange clusters. They are all small. And there is the route is here. There are only just a few cars that did not manage to park. It's because of local constraint near the route here. It's not because of the global geometry. But now watch when the number of cars will cross uh, 1,000. Ah, suddenly you see major conflict here, big clusters. And if you go into the super critical regime, aha, you see there that there are very long proportion of the tree, long portion, long branches where there, there is a positive flux. And actually, this red color here means that many, many cars went out of the parking lot without parking. So uh, let me just enter the super critical phase a bit more. And you see there that, well, basically now a positive fraction of uh, the car did not manage to park. And there is a big flux of car along the long branches of the tree. Is that clear? So we want to understand this picture from a mathematical point of view in the scaling limit and go to infinity. OK? Do not hesitate to interrupt huh? once again. So, these are uh, pictures of what you just saw with a uh, bit more uh, bit more vertices. I think it's ten thousand. So it's the the um, it's the picture of the parking process in the subcritical regime. So when 0.4 times n cars have parked, so you see that the clusters of parked cars here are all small. This is the critical regime where you see clusters which are of the size of the tree. And this is the super critical picture when you see that there is a long, a long, long branches of the tree. There is, uh, there is big flux, and many cars did not manage to park. Okay. All right. This is uh, the most uh, indigest uh, slide of the talk. It's a theorem, but I, I'm, I, I will go through it. But I am not asking you to digest this uh, slide right away. This slide will tell you. Uh, a bit more information about you, what you just saw here. So what does it say? It says that the critical window is actually M. Uh, I remind you, M is the number of cars. The critical window is N over 2. This you know. I told you that the phase transition happens when you have 0.5 cars. Uh, the density is 0.5, uh, so it's N over 2 here. But actually, we have a critical window. So interesting phenomenon will appear when you vary this n over 2 by a factor which is of order n to the 2 thirds. And this lambda parameter here is a real that can be positive or negative. So it's, if it's negative, it's slightly subcritical. If it's positive, it's slightly supercritical. So we will look in this window, this number of cars, and we will look at the, num the number uh, not the number, the size, oops, sorry, the size of the clusters. So what are the size of the clusters? So it's roughly this picture. You imagine that you look at the clusters of parked cars. So you just cut all the vertices where you have no car uh, parked. This decompose your tree into a bunch of subtrees. And these are the part components. And you look at their size, size in terms of number of vertices. OK? And so what we showed with Alice is that we have a dynamic, a dynamic scaling, dynamical scaling limit. If you renormalize those uh, cluster sizes by n to the minus two thirds, we have to put apart the cluster of the root because it plays a special role. And we'll come back to that uh, in a minute, but it's the same exponent. Then you have to renormalize by n to the two thirds. And you have to renormalize the flux of cars. So the flux of outgoing cars is the number of cars that did not manage to park by n to the minus one third. And if you do that, then you have a good scaling limit that I will describe in a moment. OK? So let me give you a couple of pictures that to, just to illustrate this theorem. This is what I told you. Uh, just before, you have this critical picture. You remove all the vertices that uh, do not accommodate a car. 
and you have a bunch of components here. And this theorem tells you that we understand the size of these components in, uh, in the critical window. And we also understand what is the flux. So the flux is this blue line here, the flux of outgoing cars. And uh, in the scaling limit, scaling limit, we have a process which is random. This D of lambda is the this simulation is this guy. And uh, okay, let me not uh, be more precise uh, at this point. Okay, questions on this uh, theorem? Uh, no? Just one question, Nicolas, yes. just to make it a bit more interactive. Sure. So if I understand it correctly, once you know the, I mean, even in the discrete case, when you know the collection of clusters sizes, then you, the law of the global picture is just gluing them at random, right? Uniform and random, is that? Exactly. So, so, so you are... know, not only, I mean, this gives you the information about everything, not just the, the cluster size, right? Perfectly, yes. But, but very interesting question. Uh, uh, indeed. Conditionally on their size, they are independent, those guys. But the law of these guys, and we'll come back to the last, come back to that in the last part of my talk, the law of these guys is not usual random trees. They are not uh, Cayley trees. They are much more elongated, and we will see that they are these gross fragmentation trees. And then conditionally on that, then you have to glue them back uniformly at random. So this, this second part is very well uh, understood. But we are still missing a bit this uh, scaling limit for the component size. We're working on that, but it is, uh, it is still working progress. But you're totally right. OK, so, so let me uh, now uh, give a glimpse of the proof. And uh, perhaps surprisingly, the proof will go through the Erdos-Reni random graph. So it is not. Um, perhaps um, not surprising for those who have seen this uh, exponent two thirds and uh, the window, but it's surprising uh, at first glance when you see the model. So uh, let me uh, first make the, you know, the, the most basic uh, remark. It's the usual idea in random graph. Uh, we want to explore the random graph tiny bit after tiny bit, step by step, and not reveal the random graph at once because, uh, because we, we lose many symmetries. It's a key idea that is, has been exploited for you know, 50 years now. Uh, we are still uh, digging on that. And so the idea now is to reveal. So you have your random tree TN, which is here that you see, but you don't want to see it uh, globally. You want to reveal it piece by piece as uh, you need to accommodate the parking process. So to be more precise, I will denote TNM. It's the subforest made of all edges, all these red edges that are emanating from a parked vertex. So the, the parked vertices are those black dots. So you imagine that you park all these cars. You have black and white dots. The black dots have a car. And you take all the edges coming out from these black dots. And then you have components. And those components are the TNM. I see that there is a question in Q&A. Uh, can I see that? I don't see. And, and how has raised her hand? Uh, I, I don't hear you, uh, Vendelin. The question is about the mode of convergence. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, it's it's in distribution for the proper Skoroko topology on the on the good Polish space in the end. So let me not enter the details. Uh, uh, I don't want to lose the, the the audience. But yeah, in distribution for the proper Skoroko the G one topology on the proper Polish space. It's Polish space. Okay, so we have this subforest TNM, and the basic idea will observe that TNM when n is fixed as a process in M. So when you let car ride one by one, is a Markov chain. So once you have said that, it's, it's not a big deal to prove that it is a Markov chain, but it has actually very nice probability transition. And this will enable us to couple this Markov chain with a variation of the erdos reni that I will now describe. So here is the rough sketch. We have a Markov chain, and we will describe the probability transition of this Markov chain, and we will see that they evolve, roughly speaking, like multiplicative merging, as in the Erdos-Renit, 
this, this is just impressionistic, and so do not try to, to get the details. And we will uh, use this uh, probability transition to couple the mod model directly with a variation of uh, the uh, Erdos-Schrenny random graph. And, uh, and this will kind of uh, prove the theorem. But if, for the purpose of this talk, I will present this coupling in the case of random mappings, not random trees, because it's a bit, uh, bit easier, a bit less technical. So what is a random mapping? Uh, I will come back in a minute. I will first present what is the variation on this Erdos-Schrenny random graph, because I think it's a model which is interesting in, in its own. And then I will uh, introduce uh, the parking on random mappings. OK, so another story. What is the Erdos-Schrenny? OK, Erdos-Schrenny random graph, I think you all encountered that uh, at some point. You have the vertex set, which is just the n vertices labeled from 1 up to n. And you let edges arrive one by one independently and uniformly on, on this vertex set. So there is no geometry. It's mean field. For us, the version that I will take is an oriented version. So we have oriented edges that you see, this EI with the, the arrow, which is just picking two points, XI and YI, IID, and uniformly over one N. OK, so it's just an oriented edge going from XI to YI. But in particular, I allow the possibility that YI is equal to XI. So I, I may have loop, and I may have multiple edges, which is sometimes excluded in the literature. But actually, this variant uh, is probabilistically simpler. OK, so I have these oriented edges. And the unoriented version I will denote by EI. And this Erdos-Schrenny process, GNM, is just the vertex set one up to n equipped with the possibly multiple edges, which are just the multiset of this EI, IID edges. OK? So you, you just launch m IID edges over n vertices. OK? Very well known. Now let me introduce a slight variant, which we named the frozen Erdos-Rheny. So in this variant, we will have two types of particles, the standard particle and the frozen particle. The frozen particle will be always blue. And it starts the same. It starts with n isolated white vertices. And then it evolves according to the following rule. We have edges, the same edges, this EI, that are arriving one by one. And we will decide to keep the edge or to discard the edge according to the following rule. If the edge arrives between two components which are white. And notice that when they are white, those components will be trees always. So think of white as trees without cycles. And think of blue as complex component with a cycle. So if the new edge that you are trying to add arrives, connects two white components, then you, you add it, exactly as in the Erdoshin. If the edge you are trying to add here uh, connects two white dots and makes a cycle in the graph, then you add it. And in the component, since you have a cycle, you color the component in blue. OK? When you, when you have a cycle, a surplus, you, co you color in blue. OK? And then if you are trying to add an edge between two blue components, then you discard. You do not connect two blue components anymore. But if an edge arises between a blue and a white component, then you look at the orientation of the edge. If it goes from white to blue, then you add it and you color the component, the entire component in blue. And if it goes in the re reverse direction from blue to white, then you discard the edge. OK? I will come back to those rules later. So, so don't worry. Simulation. So, n is equal to 500, and I will let edges arrive one by one. So in the very beginning, it's exactly as in erdos schrenny because you have no cycle, so you just keep adding edges one by one. OK? So it's the same evolution as the, in the erdos schrenny But then, at some point, you will create a cycle. Up, you saw here, you have a cycle, so you color the component in blue. And this component now is frozen, and it will evolve differently uh, uh, compared to the Erdos-Rheny uh, component. 
So you see another component here. So it's not exactly frozen, but it's slowed down. You see that they still increase, but at a rate which is a, a bit slowed down. Okay? And in the end of the day, everything is blue. Okay? So that's the frozen Erdos-Schredi process. Questions? No. Okay. Now let's come back to parking on trees. But I, to I told you that it's easier to do parking on mappings. So what is a mapping? It's a variation on the notion of tree. It's just, uh, so in a tree, every vertex has one outgoing edge targeting the, the root vertex. And, uh, and you have no cycle. If you remove this condition, you may have cycles. And it's just an acyclic graph, oriented acyclic graph, so that every vertex has one outgoing edge. OK? So if you prefer, you have your n vertices, and every vertex has a target, one target, which is just IID huh, for uh, every vertex. You choose one target uniformly at random and independently of the others, and you connect uh, with these oriented edges. OK, that, that makes a, a uniform random mapping. Believe me, but the, the local structure of those guys is really, really close to that of uh, K trees. Then I will always uh, forget about the labels of those vertices. And then I will perform the parking process on such a, a graph, exactly as in the case of trees. So let's, uh, let's proceed. So in blue, these are the cars arriving on the vertices. And let's proceed to the parking process. So car number one will park here. Car number two will park here. Car number three will park here. Car number four will try to park here. But the three has already taken the spot. So the four will park here. You see? Car number five parks here. Car number six uh, tries to park here. But the one has taken the spot. So follows and parks here. Car number seven parks here, and car number eight arrives here. Ah, the spot is taken, so I take the outgoing edge, and I'm back on my feet, so I take the, I, well, that's an endless loop. So we say that when a car is caught in an endless loop, then it just exits the parking lot. OK? Is that clear? Good. And exactly as in the case of trees, the idea will not to, uh, to reveal the uh, random mapping at once, but to reveal it step by step. And so exactly as in the case of trees, I will denote by m, little n, little m, the sub mapping made of all the oriented edges that are emanating from vertices which contain a car. So you look at all the vertices that contain a car, and you take all the outgoing edges from those vertices. And for reason that will be clear in a minute, when a component, so you see this divides the mapping into components, you see those gray components. And when a component has a cycle, exactly as in the Erdos-Rheny, frozen erdos I will color it in blue, just to, to have the color uh, code uh, in mind. OK? Now, here is the crux. We will make a coupling, we will make a construction, a joint construction of, on the one side, the parking process uh, on a random mapping, this MNM, and on the other side, the frozen Erdos-Rheny. So what was the frozen Erdos-Rheny? It was this guy here. So I will make, I will perform such a construction so that they have the same components not the same geometry inside the components, but the same components in terms of vertices. OK? And here is the rule. So I will describe the rule several times So uh, because it's uh, the, the key. So the rule is to construct step by step the mapping, to have a Markovian construction of the mapping using the following rule. So it is a bit uh, weird at first glance, but we will, we will see in an example. So the rule will be the following. We will use these edges EI, this EM that we used in the erdos -Rheny. We will interpret the origin of EM as a car arriving on the vertex XM. 
then we will use the edges of the mapping to park the car. So this car arrives here, everything is taken until it finds a free spot here. So the car will park on this free spot. And then we will use the target of the edge EM to add an edge in the mapping, this orange edge from the, the, the vertex on which the car parked to this vertex YM. OK, I know it's weird, but let's see that in practice. So once again, I have my end vertices, and I have many oriented edges. Here I have 18 of them. These are all the oriented edges EI. And on the left, I will construct parking and mapping from these edges. And on the right, I will construct the frozen Erdos-Rémy. OK? Just recap of the rule. That's the rule to construct the mapping. Once again, when I have an edge EI, it's a car arriving on the vertex. The car will park, and I will add the edge from the vertex, from the vertex on which the car parked to the YM. And the frozen air de will uh, evolve according to those rules. Roughly speaking, you add edges as long as you have no cycle. And when you have a cycle, you color in blue. OK, so let's hang on. Right, frozen air de left, parking on mapping. The first edge to arrive is this one. What do I do on the frozen air de Chenille? I just add the edge. On the parking on mapping, I interpret that as a car arriving on this vertex and parking there. And I told you that I will use the target of the vertex to define the target of this vertex. So in this case, it's just copying the same edge. Same for this case. It's just copying the edge in the mapping. Here also, nothing interesting. Ah, look what happened on the right hand side. On the right hand side, I was adding the edge number four here. So on the other Shreni, I just put this edge because I have not created any cycle. But on the parking side, that means that the car arrived on this vertex. It cannot park because three has taken the spot. So it will follow the edges that were present before. Yes, this edge was, was present before. So the car number four followed that edge, parked there. And now I use the target of the edge here to define what is the target of the, this vertex in the mapping. So you see those edges in orange are redirected versions of the edges on the frozen air It's just the rule that I just used. OK, edge number five, erdos and the mapping, they are the same. Edge number six, on the erdos what happened? On, on the erdos side, I added this edge. And since the component has now a cycle, you see it's an unoriented cycle, then I will color the component in blue, according to my rules. And on the parking side, a car arrived on vertex here. The spot was taken, followed the edges, parked there, and we used the target of this edge here to define what is the target of this vertex here. And that created a loop. And see, this loop is oriented. And according to my rule, I colored the component in blue because it has a loop. When I have a loop arriving, it's same business in the air de and parking, but I color it immediately in blue because I have a loop. A loop is a special case of a cycle. OK? Now, I have this edge number eight arriving on the frozen air de Remember, on the air de if I try to add an edge between two blue components, I discard the edge. And on the parking side, what happened? I have the car number eight arriving on a component that has a cycle. That means that this car will be trapped in an endless loop. So actually, this car exits the parking. So that means that when I discard an edge on the frozen air Toshreni, it's exactly corresponding to those cars in the map parking on mapping that did not manage to park. OK. Let me move a bit faster. This is the edge number nine arriving on the frozen air de Chenille. And you see, 
it arrives here between a white and a blue component. So you remember that, that you had an edge between a white and a blue, you do add it. And here you redirect the edge. So on and so forth, then you have, you know, uh, we'll speed up a little bit. You have a uh, car number 10 arriving here, caught in an endless loop and corresponding to the fact that I discard this edge and so on and so forth. So let me move on. And in the end of the day, when you have tried all possibilities, in the end of the day, on the right hand side, you have the frozen Erdoschreni that is completely blue. And on the right hand side, you have the random mapping that is totally discovered together with IID car arrivals. And you see that the components are the same. Look at this component. It's exactly the same as this one. Not the geometry, but the component. OK? So that's, that's the theorem. And let me, uh, OK, the theorem holds for mapping, but also a variation of the theorem holds for trees, but I will not enter the details. And you see that uh, there are immediate consequences. One that is uh, striking is that you have a, uh, an expression for the probability that you have m cars that manage to park on the tree. If you remember the coupling, the fact that you manage to park is related to the fact that there is no cycle. And so you relate this probability directly to the fact that your Erdoschreni, very standard Erdoschreni, is acyclic. And this number is very well known. And in particular, you can make a synthetics at the critical uh, probability, at the critical threshold, when uh, you have n over two cars, and you find a uh, very nice um, uh, critical exponent, n to the minus 1, 6, that was already uh, uh, seen by uh, Lackner and Panot. OK. OK. That's a bit technical, but let me give you the flavor. Now, how to move on to the theorem? Well, for those who know Erdoschreni, uh, you uh, know, or if you don't, it's uh, written on the slide, that the Erdoschreni, the standard Erdoschreni, has a phase transition for the component size, and the critical window and the scaling limit has been identified by uh, Aldous in the famous paper in '97. Uh, and in the Erdoschreni, it uh, it is it goes as follows: If you look at the component sizes in the Erdoschreni, when m is this guy, so n over 2 plus lambda n to the 2 thirds, then you have a dynamical scaling limit for those component sizes. And you have a process here. So the convergence is, again, in distribution for the score code uh, topology on the, the space of decreasing L2 sequences. But if you have uh, not understood that, it's not a big deal. But this process is called the multiplicative coalescent. It's a process that. Uh, you can imagine it as a family of particles of mass, of positive mass, x, y, z, and so on, so that two particles of mass x and y will coalesce to a single particle of max of mass x plus y at a rate which is the multiplication of x and y. That's why it's that's why it's named a multiplicative coalescent. And you should not be surprised although it requ requires a lot of work, but uh, you shouldn't be surprised that we have a similar uh, theorem for the frozen Erdoschreni process. But there you have components which are white and components which are blue. We have the same critical window. We renormalize by the same uh, n to the 2 thirds. And we have in the limit, a process which now has values in L1 times L2, you have the, the sequence of frozen particles whose total mass is finite, and the sequence of unfrozen particles which lives in L2, and which evolves uh, according to a dynamic which is inspired from uh, the multiplicative coalescent. So two white particles coalesce in a single particle at a rate which is multiplicative. But then when you have a blue particle, the rate is slowed down. It's x over x y divided by two. It's reminiscent of the fact that when you add an edge between white and blue, it's okay. But when you add an edge from blue to white, you don't take it. That's why the rate is divided by two here. And you have white particles becoming blue particles at a rate which corresponds to the creation of cycles inside the particle, which is this rate, x squared over two. Okay. Okay. And given this theorem, 
and the coupling, the proof of the theorem uh, is not a big deal now. But now let me come back to the question. I still have uh, five minutes, right? So let me come back to the question of Bendelin. Given those uh, two, uh, two theorems, we understand very well the component sizes in the critical window. But we do not yet understand the geometry of those components. So remember, this is the picture that you see in the critical window. You cut all the vertices that, are, uh, that do not have a car. You have a bunch of trees, which are what we call fully parked trees, because these are components that so that every vertex has a car. So you, here is an example. Here you have a tree and the car arrivals so that after the process, all vertices are taken exactly all that is taken and the root is free. These are fully packed trees. And this is a simulation of a fully packed tree of size uh, 15,000. Okay. And it's not hard to see that conditionally on their sizes, the components are uniform fully packed trees on their sizes. So if you understand the scaling limit of those guys, then you just, well, it's uh, a lot of technical works, but you just have to review. So what are those beasts? Those beasts, I first claim that they are very strange random trees. Why? Because if you condition on their size, big N, not to confuse with the little N of the uh, Erdos-Renyi, if you uh, denote their size by big N, then they have a typical height or typical diameter of order N to the three quarters which is a strange exponent for those people uh, dealing with random trees. And the flux of cars, so the total flux, the total flux is, is you sum over all edges the number of cars that have been through them, or equivalently, the total distance traveled by all the cars. And you find this strange uh, five of four exponent. OK. And actually, we have. Uh, a conjecture that is based on solid ground, that if you take those guys, those fully packed trees that I denote by Pn, you rescale their metric by n to the three quarters, and you rescale the flux on the edges. So remember, each edge has a number, which is the number of cars that have been uh, traveling through that edge. You renormalize that by square root n. You should be. Uh, you should have a scaling limit, which is a, a random tree, T, together with a, a process on it, phi of x. And those beasts should be the gross fragmentation processes associated, canonically associated to three half stable process uh, uh, that has been introduced by Bertrand. Let me just give you a glimpse of the construction of those objects. Those objects are obtained by starting. Uh, with a version of a three half stable Levy process with only negative jumps. So it's a process here that evolves and that can go a bit upwards, but uh, go downwards uh, by jumps. Uh, you start from one and you have a, con you have a version of those uh, process that is conditioned, say, to, to hit zero continuously. So imagine a process like that. And you will interpret this. This has the life of a particle of mass one, and every negative jumps will be a birth event for the particle. So this life is one branch of the tree, and for each birth event, you will create a new particle whose mass is exactly the size of the negative jump, and whose lifetime is a branch that you graphed here on the tree. And you do that for all jumps. So they are countably many, but you need to you know, do a cutoff procedure and pass to the limit. And you do that for every negative jumps. And you iterate also inside the branches. So you do that uh, ad vitam aeternam. And in the end, you have a tree, a continuum random tree, together with a decoration on it. The decoration is just the value of the process that you see. OK, let me give you a simulation of this. That's a real simulation, I mean, discrete simulation. You start with a particle of mass one, and the width that you see is the, the size of uh, it's this process. 
And so it, it dies at zero here. And you interpret each negative jump here as a birth event, and you create a new particle. You see here, it has a negative jump, and you start a new particle, and so on and so forth. And in the end, you have a tree. I guess that you see the tree structure beneath this picture. And the label is just given by the width. So those beasts are known. Uh, so you have to combine the work of Bertrand and uh, Rambart Winkel to give a proper definition to those beasts. But you need also to do nasty thing, nasty conditioning, because there I told you how to build a tree starting from a particle of mass one. But actually, we need to, to do that for a particle of mass zero. So it's a degenerate conditioning. We have to condition on the total area to be one. So let me put everything under the road. And um, in the end, uh, we should uh, we should have the the the, the tree. Let me just uh, finish with a coincidence, which I think is not a coincidence, is that those trees already appeared in the study of uh, scaling limit of random planar maps or UV quantum gravity. Uh, so in the work that I did with Jean, uh, Igor, and uh, and Timothy, or in the work of Miller Sheffield implicitly, or in the work of uh, Le Gall and Riera a couple of years ago. So, planar maps, what are those guys? It's just you have triangulations, you glue triangles to, uh, to make a sphere. So, it's an embedding of a planar graph in the sphere, seen a two deformation. So, it's a really a combinatorial object. You have to think that you glue n triangles to form a sphere. And you see that as a metric space. So you don't imagine, I, I know I'm quick here, but it's for you know, inspiring. Uh, so you, you have a drawing on the sphere, but don't see the drawing on the sphere. Imagine that it's a metric space. And if you do that, this metric space has really a fractal structure. It should look like a beast like that. So that's a kind of isometric embedding. It cannot be isometric, but it's close to isometric in a three-dimensional space, but it's a two-dimensional object. And the idea is to pick a point in this metric space, pick a point here, put the point downstairs, and now imagine that you draw this as a cactus by putting all the vertices at a height, which is corresponding to its distance to the point that you distinguish. OK, so it's a cactus here. Now you slice this cactus at height, and you have the guy that I just described, this version, should I say, the version of, of this random tree here. Is it a coincidence? I think not, but uh, we'll see in a couple of years. OK, thanks a lot for your attention. OK, thank you a lot, uh, Nicolas. So I think we have to be very, uh, I have to be ruthless with uh, time and questions, uh, as I'm always am. Um, I, I'll just allow myself one question, to very quick one. So I mean, the the model is very reminiscent of minimal spanning trees, sort of uh, you know minimal you know per percolation. So we, on the one hand, you know that in the two D case, uh, Garbon, Peter, Schramm understand very well what's going on in the scaling limit. On the other hand, you have this LQG. Your percolation on the LQG story. Yes. So, so the the likely scenario is that sort of uh, one can describe the same object directly on you know square root of eta LQG with the the. That would be wonderful, but story. but okay, yeah, you're totally right. So when you add the edges in the minimal spanning tree, it's you add you take Erdosheni and you add edges one by one. But when you create a cycle, you don't add the edge. So it's yeah. very, very close to the frozen Erdoshrini. Very, very close. So actually, the frozen Erdoshrini, I guess, uh, will produce objects which are very, very close to the minimal spanning tree. So that's on the one side. But the connection between the frozen Erdoshrini and, and our parking and mapping goes through a redirection of the edges. Mm -hmm. So in, in the minimal spanning tree, when an edge arrives, you add the edge. But in our model, when an edge arrives, it's a car arriving here, we'll park here, and we use the target to add this edge here. Mm -hmm. So that produce really elongated trees, which are not yeah. the same. So yeah. passing this coupling to the scaling limit is really challenging, but that would be wonderful, because on the one hand, you would be describing minimal spanning trees through CRT, through uh, planar maps, through LQG. 
but yeah. But on the other hand, on the other hand, it's it's true that your your random shapes they are deterministic function of the history of the way the thing has been created, even in the continuum in the scaling limits. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I would guess so. Yeah. yeah, I have no proof, but I would guess so. I, uh, yeah, but you would okay. The, the basic way to do that would be to 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 apply some cutoff and to see that uh, mm -hmm. that you can. Yeah, yeah. As to the it's, but it's okay. challenging because you really change the the exponents. Okay, Nicola. So uh, thank you very much. For those of you who uh, don't know, um, you know, one of the things we like to do is uh, looking at the background. And uh, apparently, you are in, are in the wonderful Orsay building. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we can encourage everyone to, you know, one day visit uh, the new math department in Orsay, which is a very, very nice uh, place to do mathematics. You may see the trees. Yes. Yeah. And the uh, there's a there's a question that arrived by uh, there's a guy called Jeff Bezos. Uh, he's just about to fly off, but he had a very interesting question about parking of uh, flight capsules when they come ah. back from you know tourism. So he's just on his way. Uh, he, he just shut his door. But I, I I'm sorry, Jeff. There's no time for your question. Um, so. <laughs> So thank you everyone for attending and uh, yeah, thanks again, Nicola. Bye. Thanks, thanks everybody. <laughs>